All right, welcome back to the Young Entrepreneur's Bible. This is episode four. Unfortunately, today, um, Ed can't join us. He's out partying in New York. I wish I could be there with him, but I'm not. Um, but today, we have Armando Vera Carvajal. Armando, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here, mm -hmm. by the way. Yeah, it's really, really a pleasure to be here. Um, Armando Vera Carvajal, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Hangtight. Um, also one of the original co-founders of the New Chip Accelerator, um, former VP of uh, product there, uh, and also very, very happy UT alum, uh, class of 2014. So, so good to be back on campus. Yeah, and I think you're the first alum that we've actually had really? on the Young Entrepreneur's Bible. Wow. Um, it's an so, honor. So, um, you know, I guess I, I just want to start off talking about your time here at UT and uh, maybe, you know, give us a little bit of background on your education your experiences, what it was like here, and how it's like coming back. Yeah, definitely. So um, UT, uh, for me, I, I moved to Austin back in 2009. Um, started my time here as an undecided student. I had, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but I actually had no real idea as to what I wanted to do in life. Um, so I was undeclared for about a year and a half, two years. Uh, I ended up majoring in international relations, mm -hmm. um, which at the time when I started did not exist <laughs> as a major. So I, I was actually one of the first students to actually test out that entire program. Oh. Um, I ended up, you know, pursuing two different degrees, international relations and corporate communication um, here at UT and also uh, pursuing one of those certificates at McCombs, mm -hmm. like a business foundations program, which was phenomenal, just connecting all the dots around the world. Um, I really thought that I wanted to go down the diplomatic track, go into foreign affairs, work for the UN, the State Department, something like that, take over the world. Um, but in practice, in theory, it wasn't really what I thought I really yeah. wanted to do. I think uh, it seemed too bureaucratic, too rigid. I wanted to do something a little bit more free-spirited. Um, and I think that tied back a lot more to who I was as a person growing up. Um, for some context and background, I'm... Uh, originally from Mexico City. I'm a first generation immigrant here in the US. Um, I moved here with my, my mom, my dad, and my sister when I was four years old uh, from Mexico. So we grew up in South Texas, McAllen. Um, very different life than we have here in, in Austin and in most parts of the US. Um, and challenging in many different ways. So coming to Austin, uh, coming to UT was very, very transformational for me from a, a, a shift in perspective, but also from being exposed and confronted with a lot of different realities, different cultures, different mindsets, all the better, right? Like bigger mindsets, bigger ideas, pushing me and compelling me to like pursue these paths that I didn't even think were viable for me at that time. And, um, you know, I very, very confused college student. I thought I wanted to do all kinds of things, uh, that, that path and that journey unfolded itself at its own pace. Um, I ended up, like I mentioned, studying those two different degrees, um, had a chance to study at, uh, twice, study abroad twice in Singapore at NTU and then in Paris at Sciences Po. Um, transformational experiences as well in and of itself. Um, but yeah, UT itself as an experience um, was one of those moments in my life that was very uh, key, right? Like very, very much shaping who I am today uh, for better or for worse, right? I, I know when I got here and I decided that I didn't want to be a doctor after my first semester, you know, taking chemistry and all that stuff here at UT, I thought I wanted to do business. And um, I didn't get into the business school. Like, mm -hmm. I applied. I, I got in, in one of those uh, FIGs, first-year mm -hmm. interest groups, and all of my peers were, were – that FIG was designed to get you into business school, and I was the only one that didn't get in, um, which was very sort of frustrating for me. Uh, they all got into McCombs. I didn't. Um, so it kind of left me with a world of opportunities to explore and, like, I guess, create my own track here at UT, which is what I love about this this institution, right? They give you so many options and so many more resources to, like, pursue what you want. Yeah, absolutely. I would have to agree with you on a lot of that. And honestly, there's a lot of overlap in our stories. Um I also started off as an undecided, uh, you know, UGS student. Yeah. Um, what I originally thought I was going to do when I came to college was I thought I would be an attorney or really? I wanted to be an attorney. And so um, originally I thought I want to be an attorney that makes a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So I tried to do patent <laughs> law, pursue patent law. And then yeah. um, 
you know, I guess being kind of dumb or ignorant, I thought I would try and do electrical engineering as my undergrad mm-hmm. because that's one of the best majors for like patent attorneys. Yeah. Horrible idea. I'm mm-hmm. not good at STEM. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't do well in my science or math classes. Got really bad grades my freshman year. Um, and then was in a position where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. And my grades are too bad for me to get into what I really wanted, which was Macomb's. Because yeah. I thought, you know, I could still go to Macomb or go- get into Macomb's, uh, study business, and then maybe be some sort of, you know, business attorney. But yeah. then... Um, you know, I I think honestly, I, I would say one of my biggest regrets was that I did give kind of give up on myself and mm-hmm. I didn't even try to apply. Mm-hmm. So I just decided to study government mm-hmm. on still on that track of let me go be an attorney. And yep. then it doesn't even matter at this point because, um, like you said, there's so many opportunities at this university in this city. Oh, yeah. And I learned that I wanted to be an entrepreneur myself. I wanted to do something free spirited and I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea for me was always to open or own my own small business. If I were a lawyer, my own firm or something like that. But I think honestly being here and learning more about the tech industry, the software industry, it felt like me. Yep. I felt like I could be, myself Mm -hmm. i didn't have to tiptoe around the office wearing a suit and like you know having to be all cat or you know just worry so much about what i was saying or what i was interested in i could really be me my authentic self and i think that's what i really enjoyed about it and so that's why i decided that i wanted to do this um i i mean i just i think that that's great and I, i guess um you know you were in you were in Lebo when you hear you were here, correct? Yeah, at that time Lebo was I think brand new, pretty pretty small organization at that time. How was it? It was cool. It it was a it was a bit of a different sort of experience because you had Latin American uh, students from all around mm-hmm. Latin America and growing up in the Valley in Texas, um, you know, you're primarily exposed to like Hispanic like Mexicans, right? Yeah, like self. Uh, but here you had. Uh, students from Chile, Argentina, uh, Ecuador, Peru, Costa Rica, what, everywhere, El Salvador, right? So it was, it was um, a, I don't want to say a clash, but it was like a nice, diverse mix of yeah. different ideas. Obviously, like shared language and shared culture, which was very, very um, uplifting because sometimes you also feel pretty left out, right? Like coming from these backgrounds, uh, you feel like the world looks very different than you look. And it can feel very daunting to want to fit in or to want to assimilate. Uh, and then when you start to meet a lot of people who have a lot in common with you, especially culturally, um, you have hope, right? It like mm-hmm. opens a lot of doors and it opens your eyes and opportunities where you didn't think they existed. Yeah, no, definitely. I um, I, I, I wish I would have joined one of the Latino Oregon on campus. Yeah. I kind of regret not doing that as well. But, you know, there's just so many things here at UT you yeah. can't get around to all of them and sometimes you just find your your niche and you stick with it so like for myself Mm -hmm. um i am a part of texas wranglers i joined it freshman year and although you know i'm not as um involved as i once was a lot of my friends uh, Mm -hmm. my best friends come from there and so i think it's great because you get to um you just create your own community and um with like an organization like wranglers it's a pretty diverse pool of guys from different backgrounds different ethnicities different places and different yeah. interests so i really enjoyed that yeah and i <laughs> i think organizations in general are important right you need community especially during your formative years when you're in college and university like you you need to surround yourself with lots of different people different mm-hmm. perspectives but also you're actively in this co-creation process where you're finding your tribe right like and and sometimes you don't even know which to which tribe I belong because you don't really know who you are. Yeah. Right. And it's that self discovery process where it's like, I don't really know if I identify with this like vibe or this group or this culture or these ideas, but it's this mixed match of like trying and going to different orgs and joining spirit groups or frats or whatever. Right. So it's, um, it's a self discovery process. And w- what would you say is like the most important thing that you learned or you kind of discovered about yourself while being in college? 
Wow. Um, it's a really good question. I think I discovered that I did not know much about yeah, life absolutely. and the world. And I think that was a very overwhelming and humbling idea. The good thing is that I've always been hungry for knowledge and UT attracts that kind of a student, you know, like mm -hmm. we're intellectually curious. We want to learn. I mean, it's on the tower. The truth shall set you free, right? And like we want the truth. We want knowledge. And I think um, just realizing that I didn't know so much and that life would be constant learning for me was very, very eye-opening. And I think tying this to what I mentioned earlier that I didn't really know what I wanted to do for the longest time. And similar to you, my first semester, I was in crisis mode. I had a very bad GPA because coming in from like uh, a region in the United States that is historically and categorically underserved education wise, I was not prepared for the rigor of UT. Yeah. So my grades reflected that. Um, and I think like I realized that I had to work a lot harder to get there um, and through the process here at, at, at UT, I realized that you can sort of confront a lot of these circumstances and situations, difficult courses, tough grades, a lot of competition in class, a lot of options. You know, you really have to prioritize. I realized that it comes down to you just taking the right decisions. Mm -hmm. and you won't know if they're the right decision until like you make progress on that. But you just have to commit to trying things out. And I did that a lot. And I think I became very open to the idea of just trying a lot of different things at UT. Um, part of it's like I did two majors, mm -hmm. right? I did a certificate. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my international relations degree, I had to focus on a language. I had to focus on a region. I had to focus, like just trying all kinds of different things. I thought I wanted to do architecture. I thought I wanted to do um, like medicine, all, all these different things, just constantly trying and experimenting. Yeah, and um, I, I wanted to go back to kind of one thing that you were talking about is you were talking about, you know, being from the Valley, it's a place that historically is underserved and yeah. underrepresented. I know that um, while you were, you know, a student here, you got to kind of do a lot of research on, um, you know, just Latino people in general. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to tell you kind of about an experience that I had um, mm -hmm. early on I actually had a similar experience. I was a part of, uh, I guess my first like internship or job as a student here was, um, I was like a undergraduate teaching assistant for yeah. a course that I was in my freshman year. Mm -hmm. um, and it was called Latinx Males in K through 12 and um, higher education. And essentially what the course, um, what the course um, was about mm -hmm. is about how um, for Latinos, Latin, Latinx, whatever you want to say, um, uh, for, you know, Latin identifying males, yeah, there is um, a lack of, you know, men in, in education in general. Yeah. So it's hard for people like us to really be engaged or to learn um, to succeed in education in general because there's not people like us that we can look up to and you know mm -hmm. i had never really thought about it until i took that class mm -hmm. like when was the last time i had a latino teacher yeah i, mean, I don't yeah. think i ever did at least for me growing up in houston and i mean houston has a significant latino population oh, yeah. i believe it's like 20 something if not 30 something percent massive yeah, yeah it's yeah. huge um, so I guess I, I want to, I wanted to go into more of your experiences, mm -hmm. um, post-grad, you know, your working experience, um, or starting your career, just having graduated as an IRG and corporate comms major, mm -hmm. um, you know, how did you go from that to where you are today? Yeah, that's the question, right? I think <laughs> sometimes it's like, how did I even end up here, right? It, I think it was a long story short. It was not a linear journey, right? Uh -huh. And I think uh, we see it, right, where it's like, it's like a map with full of like just squiggles. It's like a spaghetti bowl. I think my journey has been very much like that. Um, right at the time that I was in my senior year, because I did five years at mm -hmm. UT, um, I I had an internship. A summer internship right after I came back from studying abroad in Paris at a advertising agency in downtown Austin called Tokini, mm -hmm. Tokini Advertising, um, and I was able to get that role interning for the CEO, like being her assistant effectively, um, 
through a connection I had here at UT because I also worked for UT for some time. And I got that job. I thought I wanted a break into business. After my time in, in France, I realized this is not the track for me. Too bureaucratic. I don't want to go into government. So I d made that decision to try something different. Um, that summer was very pivotal for me. And I think that internship was probably one of the most important decisions that I've made because it exposed me and it opened a door to a whole new path that led me to where I am today. Um, through that internship, um, Yvonne Tokini, the, the, the former CEO of that company, she was also one of the founding partners, I think, of Capital Factory. Mm -hmm. um, and back then, the ecosystem here in Austin was quite small for startups. But she was there, and by virtue of working for her that entire summer, I was with her all the time at Capital Factory, um, kind of just learning mm -hmm. everything that I could about startups, about the ecosystem, um, and absorbing as much as I could. I had a chance to sit in meetings with the investors, with the startups, the decisions. Do we invest? Do we not invest? Is there a product market fit, et cetera? I didn't know much about what they were talking about. I was learning, and I, I liked it. I thought it was interesting. And then... Um, that internship ended. I ended up going to work for one of the startups I, I was on an intern basis because I met through through Capital Factory. I thought it was cool, called Equipboard. They're mm -hmm. still around. They're doing quite good. They're focused on the music gear space. Um, but I, I had my last year right at UT. I had to focus on doing my thesis, wrapping up things, graduating. Right, <laughs> five years later, it's like I, I just got to finish this. But I knew that I didn't want to do what I was studying, yeah. which was kind of frustrating, right? Because it's like I'm doing this i took out all the student loans all this debt to get this education and right at the end it's like i don't even want to do this it's like i want to do something totally different um and i got the idea to work on a startup um i'm working on that startup today over 10 years later um but at that time i said this is so cool it's solving a problem that i have that a lot of people have um the reality is i just couldn't do it at that time i had student debt i had to get a real job i had to deal with life Right. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately for me, um, I just did not have the resources or even the connections to, like, pursue that dream however much I wanted to. Maybe I, I could have if I, like, hustled enough, right? Maybe there's a part of me that wonders what if I actually had done it. I don't necessarily know. And I feel like the path that I've gone through was necessary for my development, for all the things that I've learned along the years, like, have helped me get to where I am today. Um but I had to go into the corporate world, right? Which was my nightmare. <laughs> I didn't want to go work for a big corporation. I didn't want to go do that. I said, no, no, after doing startups for like a summer and doing all that, I said, I want to go do this. And that didn't happen. I ended up going to GLG, uh, Gerson Lerman Group here in Austin. They're based in New York, but they have a big office here in Austin. And I was working with hedge funds mm -hmm. for, for four years, conducting due diligence on like public equity investments, uh, Basically, what it was is we were just helping uh, money managers managing the money of very, very rich people, the 1% of the 1% to get richer. And <laughs> while it is very intellectually stimulating, it was soul-sucking, and I was very unhappy. Yeah. Um, I realized that that was not my calling. Uh, that was not my purpose. And uh, tying that to my past, to who I am, to my DNA, right, as a first-gen immigrant, I realized that. I needed to do more, right? And I realized a lot of my peers at the time were very happy, very comfortable living the life, just kind of like socializing, which is totally fine, right? Enjoy life. But I felt like something was amiss with me. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't feel like I could just be there partying and living it up. Like I felt like very, very deeply that I needed to be doing something bigger and not that. And uh, around four years later, I got the opportunity to leave that place. Um, and one of the my previous colleagues from there, she ended up working at a place called New Chip, mm -hmm. uh, which was a startup uh, I'd never heard of, but they were at the intersection of finance and startup investing. She said, you should check it out. So I took some time off between that first job and, and soul searching for a little bit. And then I interviewed for the job at New Chip and um, I got the job. It was a pretty big step down like no safety net no financial cushion like the pay was like a third of what I was making in the corporate world um but it felt right you know like it just felt like this is a startup it's a small team 
I feel the excitement. I feel the opportunity to do something that I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And here it finally is. Right. And yeah, it might not have all the like security that a normal corporate job brings you, but it felt right. And I said, I'm going to do it right. I'm doing this for myself at the time when a lot of my peers from the previous job were going on to get their MBAs at like a Harvard or a Stanford or a UT. Right. Like that's what they were all doing. And I, on the contrary, was like going the opposite way. It's like, (laughs) I'm going to take more risk, (laughs) you know, and then go the entirely different way and risk it all. Um, So I did end up going on new chip. Um, And at that time it was very, very terrifying because I got the job three weeks later, they announced that they had to pivot the entire business model. So the job that I'd been hired for was almost basically like not going to happen because their business model was not working out. Um, It was a team of 15 at the time. Uh, Two thirds of that went right. I, I was spared because I guess in my time there, they were able to see value and, determination and I, I was just I wanted that opportunity really bad but I was terrified at the time because I was like what on earth did I get myself into like what is this right my people my, my friends my family they're saying you're crazy for like making that kind of decision like you could have gone to get your MBA at Harvard and now you're here doing this this is insane um but it still felt right and I thought it was a very unique opportunity to build something from the ground up essentially on someone else's dime, right? That's what mm-hmm. they say if you want to build a startup, like at least test the waters first with someone else's idea so that you don't risk everything yourself. And that's what was going on there. But I was very passionate about what we were building. We pivoted in the span of like a month, a month and a half. We were able to build our MVP and we launched um, at South by Southwest during the event uh, in 2019. And we built that accelerator program, which back in the day, we just had a team of five and today is like 200. So could you talk a little bit about what the original business model was and what you were originally there to do at New Chip? Yeah, so the original New Chip model was, uh, you know, like Kayak, the travel website that aggregates. Yeah, so like think of like Kayak, but for crowd investing. Mm. Crowd investing where like anybody can invest 10 bucks or 100 bucks or $1,000 in a startup. New Chip was trying to do that with... um, all the main platforms like the WeFunders, the Start Engines, the Republics, all of that, aggregating all different deals into one app. So mm-hmm. that like if I have a budget of five hundred dollars, it's like, oh, I like this deal. And I'm just like selecting things in which to invest. Great idea. But the fundamentals at the unit economic level were not fantastic or yeah. sustainable. So, you know, there had to be a pivot. But the reason why that the pivot towards the accelerator made sense was because a lot of the startups that were listing their deals on that platform were simply not ready to fundraise. Mm -hmm. Like, good ideas, good teams. However, the fundamentals were not in place, right? Like, the numbers didn't make a lot of sense. The vision was not very clear. Um, The presentation, like the pitch decks sucked, Mm -hmm. right? No credible investor would sit in front of that and say, take my money, right? Like, they needed a lot of grooming and work. And we saw the opportunity to help founders uh, polish that up, preparing themselves to fundraise from investors, VCs and angels. Yeah, I think that is extremely important because for myself as an early stage investor, I think that the information or the kind of advice that you get for how to prepare for funding is it's muddy. Yeah. It's, <laughs> there's so much out there. Now there's, it's muddy, not because there's a lack, but there's honestly too much mm-hmm. telling you different things and all of that, and it can be confusing. But I definitely yeah. think that that's, you know, an extremely valuable thing. Um, and I, I've had the chance to, uh, you know, interact with um, some of the, like, associates at New Chip, some of the younger people there, and they've all been, uh, you know, super, super nice and a pleasure to talk to. So I, I love the work that you guys are well, I know that you're not a part of the team anymore, but the work yeah. that, you know, New Chip was doing is, is I think, is phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, if you told me back then when we'd started that we would be where we are today, I'd say you're quite honestly crazy. <laughs> like, there's just no way. I, I could not see it. And I think um, New Chip was such an important part of my journey, like, for helping me become who I am because it taught me a lot about who I am right? It taught me what I'm really made of. And I started to see those real challenges, the ones that you hear about, like how entrepreneurship is hard at that time. There were points at New Chip where we had no money. Yeah. Like, and, and it wasn't like 
abstract oh we don't have money but we have money it's like no, we had no money like, i remember one day they were, like on a friday um they rounded up the team and one of the leaders there said it's friday um we have to pay you on monday uh we have eleven dollars in the bank account <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have money to pay right and, and and that's when like it really hit me and i was like oh my god like what did i really get myself into fortunately i had some savings i kind of like I didn't just jump into this. I kind of knew what I was getting myself into. And at the time I, I had a roommate, so I, I, I planned things out, but at the same time, like it was very challenging. And I think I had to take it day by day. It wasn't a situation where like I could just think everything's going to be fine. It's like, let's hopefully make it to the next week. Let's hopefully have enough money to make it to the next month. Um, I made sacrifices where it's like, you don't have to pay me this week. You don't have to pay me this month. Just pay me later, right? Mm -hmm. And and there were situations where leadership would like come up and say, "Hey, is it okay? We can you know, like pay you a little bit later." It's like totally fine. I get it. Pay that person because that person needs it more than I do right now. Yeah. Um, but those realities were a thing. I remember when we weren't, we were struggling to do our first sales, right? And we were struggling to just even get like three digit sales, <laughs> four digit sales, let alone five digit sales. Um, and I, it was very, very scary, right? Like having to innovate, having to put your all, having to like work tirelessly, weekends, long nights, not see immediate results and, and you know, hope that everything you're doing is not in vain, you know, like. Yeah. Well, I think your dedication to the company is, mm. is you know, it goes to show why they gave you that title co-founder. Because, mm. mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, you kind of explained it to me the other day, but that, that makes a lot of, of sense. Um, so I guess, you know, now I would love to get into what you're really here to talk about. So tell us about Hang Tight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang Tight. So um, Hang Tight, I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, back when I was in a student at UTMI last year. Um, I had an idea for a mobile app that would basically make it very easy for me to figure out, you know, if I wanted to hang out with a friend, like, what should we do? Where should we go? When should we do it? Mm -hmm. Right. But without having to do all of the, like the reaching out and the back and forth and the tedious guesswork and like getting rejected or like getting ghosted. Right. And that was for me very, very frustrating. Um, I wanted to work on that back then. I couldn't. And then I realized um, last year that I still had the same problem, you know, and it was in a situation where I don't have friends. I'm very grateful. I'm very fortunate. I have friends. I have colleagues, I have acquaintances, I know people almost wherever I go, right, mm -hmm. somehow, especially because in chip, the ecosystem's so big, you meet founders everywhere, you know people. The challenge is just staying in touch and maintaining those relationships. It's hard work. Yeah. Like, relationships are very hard work. I found myself a lot of the time, uh, like, just not having the ability to, like, like, wasting my time, right? Like, a Saturday would come, and I'd be on the couch at 4 35 p.m. in the afternoon just kind of doing nothing <laughs> knowing that I want to do something yeah. like knowing that I want to hang out with someone but not really having the inspiration to do it and I said I think this needs to be fixed and it hasn't been done like there's been attempts over the years but there's no conclusive winner in this space in this category and I want to give it my shot I want to like innovate and if it fails it fails but if it succeeds I think it can change the world the way that people lead their social lives and build their relationships and manage them earlier last year bouncing off ideas with some of my former colleagues at new chip and uh one of them said i think you should do it <laughs> i think you should do this thing uh, called hang tight and that guy was um now one of my co-founders rich fortune at awesome. that time he was definitely one of the the, the big drivers uh pushing me to do this right because i at that time i was quite comfortable in my job at new chip i was vp of product I'd served as accelerator director. My job was very different from the reality I described, the scary one where it's like we had no money. It's like uh, back then I was like a program manager. Uh, but at that point I was basically like managing leaders, mm -hmm. right, in different teams and all that. And it was like it's too risky. It feels risky to want to like jump and do a startup. But I knew I had that same feeling that I had back when I was at GLG, when I was in the corporate world. Like what more, right? And I could hear the words of my father um, who had talked to me a few weeks prior at that point in time, like, what else are you going to do next? Because he was like, yeah, I mean, congrats. You've made it here. Uh, you're VP of product. You're doing all these things, right? But it's like, what's next? And, like, think about that in the context of you, right? Like, 
my mom and my dad gave up everything to come to America. Their careers in government and medicine, and they started from base one. And, like, they were selling food plates at one point just to make ends meet and, like, to put food on the table for us. So it's, like, with that context, it's, like, he saw so much potential in me. And it's, like, go on and do something next. So I felt that pressure and that fire. I said, it's time to go build something. And New Chip's a big step, but it's not the end-all be-all for me, right? It could have been because I, I, there was suggestions that I would progress even higher within that company in a leadership role. But... It just didn't feel right. Um, taking the risk, jumping off the cliff, and doing my own thing felt like the natural next step. And quite frankly, <laughs> I didn't want to work for someone else anymore. Yeah. I, I felt like for the longest time I'd been fighting that idea that I wanted to pursue my dreams. I wanted to pursue the vision that I had. I wanted to stop building someone else's dream. Not that those dreams weren't worthwhile. They were. But it was time to like give myself the chance that I've always wanted to give myself. So I did. Um, and then over the summer of this past, last year, 2022, doing a lot of research, talking to a lot of different people, sort of like warming up potential relationships, advisors, mentors, potential investors. And then in August of 2022, leaving, right? Like finally saying goodbye. Yeah. Um, obviously there was a transition, right? Like two month transition internally, like so that things don't fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just goodbye. Um, but it was... Um, it was a very, very like symbolic change for me because everybody was proud. The CEO was very supportive. Everybody was very supportive. My friends, my fa everybody was just like, it just felt so right. Um, and then just jumping into the abyss, right? We've um, been going through this journey that's been like very, very, very intense, unimaginable in many mm -hmm. regards. <laughs> the things that we've accomplished in such little time with very little resources is like just astonishing. And I think... I owe that to our backgrounds. I have two co-founders, Rich, whom I mentioned, um, and Kate, Kate Grell. Um, and we all come from different backgrounds, but similar in a sense. We're, we were never handed things in life. We always had to work very hard because of our backgrounds, because of who we are, because of our upbringing and, and the challenges that we face in life. And I think that's helped shape our culture on the team, being nimble, being mm -hmm. uh, having this mindset of always doing way way more with way less right and like very yeah important that's super important and i think one thing that you said that i see in a lot of founders is this this hunger this drive this tolerance for risk as you could say and um i mean as you mentioned you know you didn't come from you came from humble beginnings mm -hmm. i know Myself, I came from humble beginnings. My mentor, Brendan Metcalf, mm -hmm. he came from humble beginnings. Um, do you think that's kind of just like a quality that comes with maybe some founders? Or do you think, you know, having so little at a young age makes you hungry for more, makes you hungry to do more? I think, yes, to a large extent. I've seen some founders who have similar backgrounds to mine of course and i've seen the opposite right yeah. so i i think i don't want to say that there's a direct correlation there but i do think the the main ingredients for lighting a fire under you are absolutely there right yeah. because the the likelihood that you've like witnessed and lived through different kinds of injustices economic social are high right and it's the story of haves versus have nots like your life is basically shaped for you when you're a kid and the things that you see and you live, especially when there's a lot of like economic instability, like it, it changes something in you. And as you grow up, like it really shapes the path that you want to pursue. Hence why I'm not studying. Like I didn't study like medieval castle history. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I, I, I want to do something that actually like change my reality. Yeah. Um, I couldn't afford to be complacent. And I think um, being an immigrant coming from humble beginnings is almost already like you already are an entrepreneur. I've always yeah, seen my absolutely. parents as entrepreneurs. I think like just leaving everything behind in a different country and starting somewhere else, especially when you don't speak the language, is tantamount to being an entrepreneur. You're taking immense risks. You're risking everything and starting a new, um, going through this entire new hero's journey, right? Yeah, no, that that's a, I think you don't, you can't afford to be complacent. You that can't. sums it up perfectly mm -hmm. and so i guess uh, you know now that you guys are um about a little bit over half a year into hang tight right yes um and uh, you know you 
we'll be releasing the platform soon. Um, I know that you guys are looking to raise. So mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of couple that with your experience at New Chip. Yeah. Um, you know, what would make a startup look great from an investor's platform? Uh, you know, what makes it strong and, and venture backable from your experiences at New Chip? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. That's one that I get all the time because I still I still mentor and advise mm -hmm. startups in the ecosystem through New Chip. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, what an investor is really looking for in, in a startup is not a product, not an idea, but a solution to a very real problem, mm -hmm. right? And that solution's backed by a team of people, right, who are in line with turning that problem into not a problem, solving it, right? And I think it's easier said than done. And I think that's what a lot of founders don't understand. I see it again and again and again. I talk to hundreds of founders every month uh, through New Chip. I review thousands of pitch decks every year. And I think the challenge is that uh, many founders are not really solving real problems, right? I think they're going after things that seem nice to have, but sometimes they're not thinking big enough. And what an investor wants to see is like, is this a very real enough problem that someone's going to want to pay you money for it immediately or at least use what you're using and down the road someone will pay um, investors want to see that and that that eventually gets manifested through product market fit right mm -hmm. which takes some time to find um, team is super important i think um, team is one of those things that oftentimes is like undermined because it's like, well, this is such a great idea. Like it's, we're going to be billionaires. We're going to go public. You know, we're going to get acquired by Facebook, whatever. Right. Like it's like to even get to any of that, like you need to have the right people and people forget that people are the backbone of any organization, of yeah. any unit. Right. It's like the people behind it are what make this even possible. Um, I've seen really good teams. Well, actually I take that back. I've seen really good ideas really good concepts fall apart because of the teams, because of the people, because of disagreements, because of misalignment with the vision, the mission, the product, the strategy, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, I've, I've, and it falls apart. I was talking to a founder the other day from Brazil who like has five co-founders and they're all going in different directions and the company's falling apart for a great idea, right? With a lot of potential investment outside. It's like, that's a challenge, right? Investors don't want to see that. Investors want to de-risk you. They want to see, like, there's a very clear problem. There's a very good team behind it. They're adaptable. They're able to shift to the, the circumstances, the realities of the market. And they are able to produce something that people want yeah. and people will pay for. What what shows, like, that ded that dedication from the team? How could a team show that dedication better? I think actions always speak louder than words, mm -hmm. right? Like any team's going to tell you, oh, we're proactive, we work hard. It's like, just show it, right? Like show the results in terms of like traction. And traction doesn't always have to be users, right? Yeah. It's, but it's not always possible to have users immediately or have revenue. There, anything can be traction in the beginning. That's something that we really teach a lot at, at New Chip. Um, your, your advisors, that's a sense of traction. If you can convince some rock stars to come and be a part of this journey with you, that says something, right? And it's not just the idea. More often than not, like a rock star advisor is not going to come on just because of you. It's because of you. They like you. They want to work with you. They believe in this. They can help you and shape you. Um, they also want to see the, the framework, the execution. That's very, very important. We've had similar situations where um, we're not live yet. As you mentioned, we're, we're launching our beta this March, very, very soon. Um, but the feedback that we've had from very very high profile potential investors and funds is that like you guys story is that you you're very good at execution right yeah. and you haven't even launched right like we've been able to acquire one of our competitors ip we've been able to build a rock star like advisory uh board right former ceo of open table one wow. of the people who built linkedin's product and ebay's mobile app um the former vp of engineering for indeed like we also have a, a venture capitalist. Yeah, you know, it's like these people that we've been able to convince, like we show that to investors like, wow, how did you do that? And it's like by doing, right? By like actually like moving and getting things together and lining up and coming up with plans and talking to people and getting advice and actually just getting things in motion. I think 
investors want to see that movement, that momentum, because they know that the idea is not even the beginning. The idea is what gets you at the table. Beyond that, it's all execution. So how has fundraising been going for you all? I mean, it seems like you have phenomenal traction, yeah. an amazing advisory board. Yeah. I would I would think people are head over heels to give you their money. Yeah, I think they are head <laughs> over heels. The thing about um, fundraising is that nobody ever wants to be the first one. Yeah. That's the reality. Um, you'll have – I see fundraising very much as dating, mm -hmm. right? And we teach that a lot at, at New Chip. Um, you wouldn't pop the question on the first date, would yeah, you? Right. Of course. <laughs> I mean, maybe you would. Maybe that that is the one you just know, and you got to seal the deal. Very but, old school, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's like you're gonna take several dates, several months, maybe several years, right? In our case, um, our strategy has been to raise from friends and family. So we're very close, very very close to closing our friends and family round, which has helped us tremendously uh, to meet a lot of the sort of like immediate needs. We've been bootstrapping at the same time. Uh, we're not paying ourselves, but we're just, you know, putting in money to just keep this thing going. Yeah. Um, but we will be launching uh, a bigger raise in the coming months to, you know, uh, bring in potential investors. The reality is, like, there's different factors right now. You have the recession, right? Um, you have all of these issues with um, investors just kind of not investing in anyone. Yeah, depending on the circumstances, right? But there are a lot of investments being made. They just want to see traction. They want to see revenue. And realistically, we're not there yet, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're barely getting out there. So I think in our situation, there's a lot of interest. Um, investors have told us we really like you guys. We like the problem you're solving. You're not the first one that we've met that is trying to do this, but we like how you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And we like the vision that you have for the world. Because for us, hang tight's not just about having a, an app that makes it easy for you to coordinate hangouts. It's about becoming your social passport, right? Yeah. Like 10 years from today, we see hang tight as no different than Uber is for you going places, right? You want to hang out, you want to go on dates, you want to network professionally, you use hang tight. It's like, hey, just hang tight it. Like, let's meet in SF or in New York or here in Austin, just hang tight. That's what people do to like go and hang out. Yeah. And also, I, 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 you know, want to touch on, I feel like you, you haven't really um, talked about how amazing the, the product is. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to, to Kate and I came up with this phrase. Uh, you guys can use it. Now. Um, we did write it in the kind of cold email that we've been sending out. But it's um, uh, something along the lines of um, you can schedule um, – things or you could schedule events or meetups with your friends yep. by just prompting who what when and where yep yeah, and yeah that's it's as easy as that it's super easy and that's like that's hitting at the main friction points that we're tackling right so uh part of the product um is we're building it on a machine learning model right and, and this all comes also from like the acquisition that we made um, which is very valuable to us. It automates the process. And right now, AI is like, again, the big craze, chat GPT yeah. and all these things, like everyone's looking at generative AI and that's definitely a path that we're going to go down. But we, we want to be your social assistant, right? We don't want to be a future where you have to figure things out. We want a future where like, it's telling you like, hey, you have some time this Saturday afternoon. How about you go hang out with Armando and go kayaking? It's like, Perhaps you didn't even think that I was available to hang out or yeah. that I'm even in Austin. Maybe you think I'm somewhere else where it's like, it's telling you like you could be doing these things and it's inspiring you. Yeah. And I think half of the time, the hardest part about hanging out with your friends is reaching out, reaching out. Yeah. It really is. Um, well, I mean, that's great. And I guess, you know, I, I want to kind of get away from the business and career side now mm -hmm. and want to talk about how interesting of a person you are. Oh, <laughs> so your photography portfolio is amazing. It's so beautiful. Thank you. I looked at it. Uh, I was researching. I did. I did some 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 scouting. Yeah. And I found your Instagram, and mm -hmm. then looked at your portfolio from there, which I thought was amazing. Um, you're a huge traveler, Thank so I'm assuming when you travel, you take your camera with you, right? I try. I I have a DSLR. Uh, it is. I actually had a conversation last night with the photographers, and it's like it's just so clunky and heavy. Yeah. But I take it, right, because it captures those moments. But to be totally honest, like, iPhones are so good nowadays. Mm -hmm. like, you really just need to know how to use basic principles to get a good picture. Right? So what are those basic principles? How do I get a good picture? Composition, okay. lighting, uh, 
I think me being short, 5'7", helps because, like, you can get better angles from what you see. Like, sometimes being a little taller, like, skews some vantage points. But I always say, like, basically try to see it from, like, an empath empathetic standpoint. Mm -hmm. If other people were seeing it from your eyes, what would they be seeing, right? Lighting, shadow is very important. The, the rule of thirds, right? Always, like, put someone on a third, left or right third. <laughs> um, I don't know. My photography is also very candid. I, I've i always been that weird one. Like, if you're hanging out with me and with friends, you'll probably at some point see me, like, taking a picture, and they're like, what are you doing? It's like, don't worry about it. It's like, <laughs> you'll thank me later. It's like, and they're like, wow, how did you get these pictures? Like, yeah, that's why. It's like, I just capture the moment. I capture the emotion. How long have you been doing photography for, and, like, how did you learn? Yeah, so I started back at UT. Um, oh, wow. When I was a freshman, um, my freshman year, when I was a UGS student, actually, I had the opportunity to apply for a grant that mm -hmm. they were offering here at School of Undergraduate Studies. And it was to explore your career, literally like a grant to do anything that summer. And I said, I want to go to Peru. I want to teach English to like students in Cusco. And, um, and I got it, right? And I said, well, I, I don't know, I have a camera. So I would love to take a camera. So I, I saved up some money, I worked. I bought a DSLR, a Canon T2i and I kind of just taught myself, you know, like there was a lot of resources on YouTube, like videos, yeah. how to use the settings, the manual and all that. Worst thing you can do with a DSLR is use auto. You know, you want to like <laughs> learn right. the mechanics. <laughs> I'll need to learn. Aperture, <laughs> exposure, shutter speed, all that ISO. Yeah. Um, but over the years, just kind of teaching myself, you know, like I, I never really took classes from anyone. I always looked for inspiration. And I think that's a big trend for me. Like I find what I like. And then I like triple down on it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I like this style. I don't care if others don't like it. I like it. And I keep looking more at it and I emulate it. And, and I do that. And I did that for photography, but also for art because I, I like to paint. Yeah. So tell us, you know, a little bit about your, your travel experiences. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the craziest travel experience that you've had? Yeah. Um, that's a really tough question. <laughs> I think... I've had the opportunity, the privilege to travel a lot, mainly because I've wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I've found the ways, the resources to make it happen. I don't just kind of lay there and, and wish and dream. I like find a way to do it. But I think um, back when I was a student in Singapore on exchange, I had the chance to go backpacking um, across all of East Asia, right? like not just yeah. Southeast Asia, but also like mainland China, all of those areas. And um, I remember, like, being in mainland China, not in the main cities, but, like, in, like, th the West, right, where yeah. it's, like, not everyone speaks English there, and, like, being stranded, <laughs> and, like, <laughs> taking buses where no one spoke English, and I was just, like, living off, depending on a Lonely Planet book, like, get off on this bus stop, and, like, I remember, like, one time, <laughs> I was lost, I was totally lost, and I had to, like, open the book, and I had to find a way to get to the airport, or I would miss my flight, and I was basically trying to draw the symbols for like an airport <laughs> and i remember getting off in this town and going hotel and restaurant and hotel and restaurant and asking people if they could like point me in the right direction and everybody would look at me like stone face like i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> i remember in a hotel i showed it to one lady and she was like laughing and she's like yeah it's an airplane and i was like i know but i need to get to the airplane and she's like i don't know i don't know how to help you I finally wow. found someone and they were able to like tell me yeah like I'll call a cab for you and take you to the airport. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's stuff like that. Where so you made like, your flight. I made my flight. Okay. <laughs> uh, but it's one of those things where it's like, I, I was totally lost, but yeah. I was very excited. I love adventure. Like I love travel and adventure where like it's unpredictable, where things could go wrong, where you're, it's not cookie cut. You're not, I don't, I don't like tour groups. Like yeah. what, um, what countries have you been to or how many countries have you been to? Um, I think at this point it's like around 40-ish. Wow. Um, I would love to see more, obviously. Um, I think I've been all around Europe. Um, when I studied there in France, I backpacked a lot. Also Southeast Asia, um, Latin America, like Argentina, Peru. I've been to Peru a lot. Um, Mexico, a ton, just from I'm there, and it's such a vast country. Um, I would really love to explore Africa and the Middle East. It's one of those places where I've never been. Same for, like, the South Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, etc. What's your next destination? Mm. For pleasure? 
Or yeah. For, yeah, I think I would love to go to New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. got it. Yeah, I've, I've been wanting to go there for years. It's just like adventure and like mountain climbing and jungles and beaches and all that. And I love that. And then yeah. I guess what's your next destination for work? For work? Uh, if it's not New York or San Francisco, it'll probably be Mexico City because I think we're, we're really looking to, to build the team there, like uh, engineers, product managers. Um, I think there's a big opportunity. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a great, great way to have an excuse to go to Mexico City. Oh, yeah. It's good to go back every every other two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Armando, it has been such a pleasure. Um, you know, thank you for talking to me today. I enjoyed this so much. And, you know, it was really great to speak with you today. Um, is there anything you want to tell people? Maybe how they can contact you if they want to invest in Hang Tide or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, personal advice is like just have a dream make sure that it's a very big dream and and don't let anyone stop you from it friends family like believe in yourself and it's going to be hard it's going to be challenging it's not going to be easy uh media very rarely represents reality it's going to be hard and you're going to have to sacrifice a lot to get there but if you believe in it hard enough and you actually want it you will find a way there and in that journey you're going to find the people who truly are your friends the people who truly believe in you and who who want to see you succeed and that's all that matters in the journey um i'm on instagram odian 60 i'm on linkedin harmon of hit me up i want to be a resource i love helping uh founders i love helping ut uh alumni ut community like i'm a longhorn so i'm, I'm here for you if you ever you know if you ever <laughs> want to connect don't be a stranger um and yeah, stay tuned for Hang Tight. Uh, check us out at hangtight.live. Join our wait list. Um, we're very close to launching that beta, and we expect to have a full hard launch this summer across the U.S., so stay tuned for more. Awesome. See you guys. Cheers.